Hello and welcome to Unacademy, a one-stop destination for the English medium civil services aspirants. Very good morning and welcome to the daily Hindu news analysis. So let's begin today's discussion by first looking at the topics that we are going to discuss. From the daily edition of the Hindu, I have chosen seven important articles for a detailed analysis. We have four columns which are very important for the mains exam and three smaller articles that are relevant for the prelims examination. So let's cover these topics one by one. But before we start, we have a very, very big announcement. On April 28th, that is the coming Sunday, we are hosting a mega event, Unacademy Manzil 2024. At this event, we are going to felicitate the toppers of the 2023 civil services examination. And this session or this event will be live at 1 p.m. on the Unacademy UPSC Unstoppables YouTube channel. You can find the link on our Unacademy IAS English channel as well. Now, let me tell you why you guys have to attend this event. One, you get to watch the toppers being felicitated. And for 2025 aspirants, there will be two big reveals which will help you in your UPSC preparation. Also, the event could motivate you, inspire you towards your goal as well. So do attend the session live. All the top educators will be there along with the toppers. And there are some exciting events planned as well. So do join us live at 1 p.m. on April 28th. You can also find the link in the description box of this video as well. Now coming to Conquer Prelims 2024, the free crash course which is going on. The static part of the crash course has begun and today the fifth session for Indian polity will be taken up by Sarmad Meherat sir on the Unacademy app. The link for the same can be found in the video description or else easier option is join our telegram channel. You can scan the QR code or search for Unacademy IAS English and at 6 p.m. we will share the session link. You just click on the link and you can watch the session live. Then finally, the last announcement. We have launched a new special class since yesterday. It's again a free initiative on the Unacademy app. I used to get a lot of questions from students that, sir, I don't understand geopolitics or how geography plays a role in influencing international relations. So that is why I've started a new series, a limited series of seven classes where we will understand the role of geography in influencing geopolitics. So do join the second session today on Indian Ocean region at 1 p.m. on the Unacademy app. The link again can be found in the video description below. So with this, let's get started. Let's look at this article from page number six. This column deals with the topic of star campaigners. It's a topic related to elections, right? So you need to understand who are star campaigners when it comes to political campaigning or electoral campaigning. You should understand the legal provisions and rules surrounding star campaigners. We should also analyze whether these provisions are misused by political parties and the star campaigners. How does it affect uh, electoral campaigning? And we should discuss a way forward to address the issues related to star campaigners. So this is a very important topic for your mains examination. So let's carry out a detailed analysis. So first question is, who are star campaigners? See, once elections are notified by the Election Commission of India, be it for the Lok Sabha elections or the state assembly elections, political parties, they field star campaigners to campaign for the party or for specific candidates. So these star campaigners could be top leaders of the party itself. For example, let's say in the Congress party, uh, Rahul Gandhi can be seen as a star campaigner. In the BJP, Prime Minister Modi or Amit Shah can be seen as the top leaders who can be nominated by the party as a star campaigners for the party. So top leaders of the party who are appointed as star campaigners by that party, right? they are considered as star campaigners. And also, it could be any celebrity as well. Maybe a Bollywood star or a cricket personality or a sports personality. Any well-known individual, maybe uh, comedians or TV actors, right? Even they can be appointed by a political party as star campaigners. 
who can campaign for votes for the respective political party. So this addresses your first question, who are star campaigners? Either it is the top leaders of a political party who are appointed as star campaigners, or it could be well-known individuals, celebrities, who are appointed by a party to campaign for the party or a particular candidate. So these are your star campaigners. I'm sure you might have seen in political rallies or in political events, many celebrities will also be sharing the stage with the party candidates, right? Celebrities will be delivering speeches, highlighting the achievements of that party, calling for votes uh, for that particular party, right? Similarly, top leaders of a party, they campaign across constituencies. They ask the electorate to vote for a certain candidate, right? So these are individuals who are basically crowd pullers, who can pull the crowd, attract the masses, and promote the achievements of the party and target the opposition and call for votes for the party and the candidate. So such campaigners who are appointed by a party, either the top leaders or well-known celebrities, they are the star campaigners. Now, let us look at the legal provisions surrounding star campaigners. What does the law say? Of course, the law that applies here is the RPA, the Representation of People Act 1951. So under the RPA, we have section 77 that refers to the expenditure incurred by leaders of a political party. The RPA governs election expenditure. It places a certain limit on the election expenditure of every candidate for a constituency. And it places certain restrictions on electoral expenditure for a party as well, at the party level. So under section 77, the expenses incurred by a party on leaders of that political party. This is the provision that deals with star campaigners. So this essentially governs the expenditure incurred by a party on its top leaders who are the star campaigners and even the celebrities who are appointed by the party. Let's say a party has hired actors or celebrities to campaign for the party, right? Or the top leaders of the party are campaigning. They are traveling around the country. They are using chartered flights because they have to get to uh, one constituency to the other in a short span of time. They might be staying in five-star hotels. They might be uh, moving around a lot, right, using a convoy of vehicles. So all those expenses incurred is accounted for under Section 77 as the expenditure incurred by a party on the leaders of a political party. So this is where star campaigners are regulated or governed under the RPA. Now, let us understand who can be appointed as a star campaigner and how many star campaigners can be appointed. This is also a very important provision. See, when it comes to appointing a star campaigner, there is no specific rule. There is no law regarding that. It is left to the discretion of the party. The concerned party can decide as to whom it will appoint as, as a star campaigner. Is that clear? There's no eligibility criteria as such. The only requirement is that the star campaigner has to be a member of that party. Be it the top leaders, the top leaders will obviously be members of the party. Even celebrities, right? Even movie stars, well-known uh, celebrities who are appointed as star campaigners, the only requirement is that they should, they should hold a membership of that party. They should be a member of the party which has appointed them. That is the only requirement. Now coming to the recognized national and state parties, they get to appoint up to 40 star campaigners. Is that clear? Whereas the registered but unrecognized parties, they can appoint only 20 star campaigners. The Election Commission, right, it gives these recognitions for political parties as national party, state party, uh, registered but unrecognized parties. So only national and state level parties, which are recognized by the Election Commission, they get to appoint up to 40 star campaigners. Whereas the unrecognized parties can appoint only 20 star campaigners. Now, why is this significant? This is very significant because the expenses incurred the expenses incurred on star campaigners is taken into the account of the political party. It is 
appropriated through the political party's expenses. It does not apply for the candidate. It doesn't apply for that particular candidate's expenditure. Because see, every candidate has been given a prescribed limit as far as expenses are concerned. What's the limit? In a Lok Sabha constituency for large states, the limit is 95 lakhs. A candidate cannot spend, officially cannot spend, more than 95 lakhs per Lok Sabha constituency in the larger states. For smaller states, it is 75 lakh rupees per candidate per constituency. This is the limit set by the election commission. Right? Now, in today's era, this amount is nothing. Right? It will not even cover the basic expenses. But that is, that is the limit on the candidates. Now, if a candidate wants to bring a star campaigner, let's a Bollywood actor, right? So booking a chartered flight for them, a five-star hotel, the cab and food expenses will easily shoot up. So for one star campaigner, they might, they may have to spend anywhere between 20 or maybe 25 lakh rupees. So this is not possible for a candidate. Legally, a candidate can't do this because that will exhaust their limit, right? More or less, they'll get, end up exhausting their limit if they bring two, three star campaigners. So that is why the expenses incurred on star campaigners is accounted for the political party's expenses. It will not fall into the account of the candidate. But there are certain conditions. If the expenses incurred on the star campaigner, if it has to be accounted for the party and not the candidate, then there are a few basic conditions that has to be followed by the star campaigner and by the party as well. So let's understand this. See, once the star campaigners are appointed, once the list is ready by a party, they have to submit this list to the election commission. Right? Once elections are notified, within seven days, that is within one week of notification of an election, the concerned party should submit the list of star campaigners it has appointed to the election commission and also to the chief electoral officer of the states. This is a legal requirement. But Election Commission will not interfere with the appointment process itself. It will not tell parties whom it can appoint as star campaigners. That is left to the parties. Only requirement is every star campaigner has to be a member of the party. Now in a multi-phase election, what will happen is that if elections are being held in multiple phases, the parties can submit separate list before every phase of the election. Right? Before every phase of the election, within one week of the notification of the schedule, a separate list is given by the parties that these are our star campaigners. So this list has to be submitted to the election commission and the chief electoral officer. Now, the star campaigners are bound by certain regulations. According to RPA and even the conduct of election rules, the star campaigners, what they do on the ground, the way they campaign, it is controlled, it is restricted through these laws. And if they violate any of them, there are certain consequences. For example, if the star campaigner, let's say, if the star campaigner, who's campaigning in a certain constituency, if he or she seeks votes directly in the name of that candidate, in that case, the expenditure incurred on the star campaigner for that rally or for that uh, speech or that, that particular campaign that will be accounted into the candidate's expenditure. Now, let's assume, let's say, for example, um, let's say there's a constituency in New Delhi, right? And a candidate is contesting from, let's say, one party. Now, this party has appointed a star campaigner, a celebrity. And now the celebrity has been brought by this candidate to his constituency to campaign. Now, the star campaigner can campaign in the name of the party. The celebrity can seek votes for the party, not for the candidate. If they do that, if, they, if let's say the celebrity takes the name of the candidate and urges the voters to vote for the candidate, then it means that the candidate has hired the star campaigner. That, that's what it essentially means. So, the expenses for that particular rally, let's say 5 lakh rupees was spent on this rally, where a celebrity has directly called for votes in the name of the candidate, not in the name of the party then the expenses will be accounted into the candidate's expenditure. Now, this is where candidates will face a problem because their 
election expenditure limit is already very limited. 95 lakh rupees for larger states for Lok Sabha constituency, 75 lakhs for smaller states. This is barely sufficient for them to meet the electoral expenses, the campaign expenses. So, star campaigners have to be careful. The parties, the candidates have to be careful. They can seek votes in the name of the party. They can pull crowds. They can give speeches. They can appreciate the party, praise the achievements. But they cannot seek votes in the name of the candidate. If they do that, they can. But if they do that, the expenses of that campaign or rally will be added to the expenditure of the candidate, which reduces the flexibility available to them. So this is the advantage. So essentially, it allows parties to bring in well-known leaders, well-known faces, crowd pullers to campaign around the country and around the constituencies to bring voters and to campaign for the party, not for the candidate usually. All right. Let's say I'll give you one more example. Let's say there is a, a constituency, right? A party has appointed a star campaigner and the star campaigner is sharing the dais with the candidate of that constituency on the same stage. There is a candidate of the party sitting and the star campaigner is also sitting next to them. Even that is enough because it essentially means that celebrity is adding value to that candidate, attracting the voters towards that candidate. Even in that instance, the expenditure of that rally is accounted for the candidate's expenditure, not for the party's expenditure. All right. So if this doesn't happen, let's say the star campaigner does not seek votes in the name of the candidate or doesn't share a uh, dais or doesn't travel with the candidate. Then the expenses are added to the party's expenditure because parties have been given uh, a more uh, discretionary uh, provision where they can spend a little more to campaign for the elections. But candidates have a very strict limit and they can't breach the limit. So that is one advantage of using star campaigners. They can bring the crowds, they can bring the mass appeal to the party Right? But if they campaign for a candidate, if they ask for votes for a particular candidate, if they share a stage with the candidate, if they travel with the candidate, then those expenses for that rally gets accounted for the candidate's expenditure. But now there are some serious concerns about how the star campaigners are behaving or how they are conducting themselves. That is the major issue here. There have been several star campaigners right, who have openly who have openly asked for votes in the name of caste, religion. They have made attempts to promote hatred, enmity between communities. They have, they have crossed the line of decency and decorum and targeted the political opposition with very crass language. Now, this is not tolerated, right? This is where the gray area exists in the, in the current laws. And many star campaigners have often Right? They have done this where they are in breach of the model code of conduct. The model code of conduct and the conduct of election rules and RPA, it clearly prohibits seeking votes in the name of religion, caste, language, etc. It prohibits the promotion of hatred or enmity between communities just for seeking votes. These are treated as corrupt practices under the RPA. But star campaigners have blatantly violated these norms. The star campaigners of various parties, it could be top leaders, it could be celebrities. They have crossed the line of decency and decorum and they have brought up such, such claims during their speeches and rallies, which includes abuse, abusive words, inappropriate language, calling for votes in the name of caste and religion or making uh, very abusive uh, statements about the opposition or opposition candidates. Right? So they are in violation of model code of conduct. And this is where there is one loophole. The election commission cannot really do much here. The election commission doesn't have the authority to just remove the star campaigner. It's left to the party. Election commission can take some minimal action. But here the election commission stands accused of not being proactive in dealing with such star campaigners. The election commission can at least prohibit them from further campaigning, right? It can order the parties to not use such uh, star campaigners going forward. But quite often election commission has been accused of a bias or it's been accused of not being proactive enough to act on complaints, to act on legitimate concerns where star campaigners have used abusive language, made unsubstantiated claims and allegations and even used religion, caste and, and other divisions to promote hatred and enmity just to seek votes and win elections. 
So this is one concern which is being expressed by the article. The other concern here is that the accounting aspect, the expenses incurred on a star campaigner, it's following a very outdated accounting standard. The election commission has a rate card, right, on uh, chartered flights, on hotel rates and food and travel cost. These rates are outdated, right? It doesn't account for the market rates. So this mismatch also creates a problem. What happens is parties, they have to meet the norms set by the election commission. They deliberately under-report the expenses. Essentially, they are under-reporting the expenses because election commission's rate card is outdated. So this is something that has to be addressed. The accounting has to be in line with market standards to ensure that no party is spending way beyond the allowed limits. Now coming to the practice of star campaigners using hate speech, promoting enmity, violating the model code of conduct. There is a recent controversy which has broken out that involves none other than the Prime Minister himself. Just the other day, Prime Minister Modi, who is a star campaigner for the BJP, stands accused of promoting enmity on the lines of religion and for seeking votes in the name of religion. Right? There were cer certain comments made during an election rally by the Prime Minister, which has invited a lot of criticism by the media, by the opposition parties. Complaints have been raised with the Election Commission as well, as it could constitute a violation of the model code of conduct. But still, Election Commission has not acted against it. Right? This is where Election Commission faces criticism that it often doesn't act against top leaders and star campaigners, even when they are breaching the model code. RPA clearly recognizes these practices as corrupt practices. For example, look at section 123, clause 3A and 125. It prohibits the promotion of feelings of enmity and hatred in election campaigns. It prohibits seeking votes in the name of religion, caste, language, using religious symbols. These practices are prohibited. They are treated as corrupt practices in elections. It is punishable by law, right? It's a breach of model code of conduct. So there are many other star campaigners who have done this repeatedly. In the past as well, many top leaders have uh, done it and even Prime Minister Modi himself stands accused of breaching the norms multiple times. But Election Commission of India each and every time has not acted, especially against ruling parties, especially against top leaders. So this gives rise to allegations that Election Commission is not being neutral. It's being biased. It's not being proactive in cracking down on these violations. Because there is a flaw. There is a legal loophole here. Because see, what does the Constitution of India say? What does Article 324 say? Article 324, it provides the superintendence and control of elections in the hands of the Election Commission, which is a constitutional body. Right? Election Commission of India has full superintendence and control over the conduct of elections. But when it comes to star campaigners, Election Commission doesn't have direct authority to order the parties to remove a star campaigner. This has been left to the political parties. So this can be a way forward to fix this issue, to ensure that star campaigners behave according to the, um, according to the basic norms of decency and decorum, right? to ensure they don't resort to corrupt electoral practices. Right, one option is to amend the RPA, bring changes in the model code of conduct as well, so that election commission will have the authority, full authority to act against star campaigners. Right now, parties decide whether a star campaigner should be removed. Election commission only issues orders or it will order a party not to use them, but it's not, it's not binding on them. So election commission should be empowered here to remove those star campaigners who are calling for votes in the name of religion, in the name of caste, who are promoting enmity and hatred just to win the elections, right? And another change which is needed is in the accounting standard, in the assessment and uh, apportioning of the expenditure. Election commission has to update itself. It can't use outdated rate cards, right? And today market rates are entirely different from a flight ticket to a chartered flight to five-star hotels, right? The rates are completely different. And if you are using outdated rate cards, obviously parties will be forced to fudge the accounts. 
they'll be forced to underreport the expenditure. They should not do that. And election commission has to update itself here and bring up the accounting practices, the assessment uh, standards up to the market standards. So if these things are done, it will actually act as a deterrent. Because see, now the parties will be worried. What if star campaigners are banned by the election commission? Right? So it will force the star campaigners to behave according to the lines of decency and decorum. And also maybe as a further deterrence, th the law can be amended in such a way that the expenditure should be incurred on the candidate, not on the party. That will reduce the flexibility available to the candidates. So candidates will be hesitant to bring star campaigners because the expenses will be added to their expenditure account instead of the party's account. So such deterrents have to be built in and election commission should be further empowered to remove and ban those star campaigners if they breach the established rules. This is what is needed to ensure the free and fair conduct of elections in India. So now let's look at the next column from page number seven. It's related to disaster management. Recently, Taiwan, the self-ruling island of Taiwan, was hit by a devastating earthquake. A 7.4 magnitude earthquake hit the island of Taiwan. But what's interesting is that it caused very minimal damage. The earthquake was very powerful. It caused massive landslides. It caused few buildings to collapse. But if you compare the damage of the 2024 uh, Hulian Taiwan earthquake with a similar incident that happened in 1999, there is a huge difference that you see. With regard to the impact of the disaster, with regard to the number of buildings that have collapsed, with regard to the number of lives that have been lost, the number of people who have been injured, if you compare the data of the 1999 Taiwan earthquake with the 2024 Hulian earthquake, there is a world of difference that you find. The reason is, Taiwan today has one of the most advanced disaster management mechanisms in the world. It has learned lessons from previous disasters because Taiwan is one of the most disaster prone uh, region in the world, right? It's not recognized as a country by, by most nations, by the UN as well, because Taiwan is claimed by PRC, by People's Republic of China, right? That's an entirely different issue altogether. China claims Taiwan, it claims to have sovereignty over Taiwan. Most countries don't recognize Taiwan as a country, right? But Taiwan is a self-governing region and Taiwan has learnt its lessons as, as a result of repeated disasters and today it has one of the most advanced disaster management mechanisms in the world. That is the reason why the earthquake had a very minimal impact this time. So let's look at this in slight detail because there are lessons for India. You might be wondering how is this relevant for us? It is very, very relevant for us because India is also a very disaster prone country. Because Taiwan is vulnerable not just for earthquakes. Taiwan is vulnerable for tsunamis. It's vulnerable for massive uh, cyclones. Right in the Pacific and in the East and South China Sea, massive cyclones do uh, take shape and they hit Taiwan very frequently. So Taiwan is sitting in a, in a very sensitive, delicate location. Right, it's sitting right on top of a convergent plate boundary, a very highly seismic zone that makes it very vulnerable for earthquakes and tsunamis. Plus, the country is also very badly affected by during the cyclone season. So after being hit by multiple disasters, Taiwan has really stepped up its disaster management. And today, it's on par with other countries like uh, Japan when it comes to its preparedness. It has truly built disaster resilience. So let's understand a little more about this important topic and draw lessons from here for India. See, earthquakes, they specifically occur in certain regions that is primarily along the plate boundaries, the convergent plate boundaries. If you look at the Earth's uh, lithosphere, right, the outer layer uh, of the Earth, it is made up of 15 major fragments, 15 uh, major plates. These tectonic plates, they are in constant motion relative to each other. They are brushing against each other, they are drifting apart from each other or they are subsiding under the other, right, they are diving under one plate. So such constant interaction is happening between the 15 major plates that make up the lithosphere, the outermost layer of the earth. Now, all the earthquakes, all the seismic activity that we witness, right, they all occur at these plate boundaries, at the convergent plate boundaries. 
where there could be a subduction zone, right? Or where plates might be drifting apart or brushing against each other. That is where we witness these seismic events, which we call as earthquakes. Take, for example, how the Indian plate is diving under the Eurasian plate. It's an active subduction zone. It's a convergent plate boundary. That's what makes the Himalayas and the region around it one of the most seismically active regions in the world. So please look at the, the map here. It is depicting all the 15 major plates, the tectonic plates of the world. From the Pacific plate to the South American plate to the African plate to the Indian plate here. As you know, the Indian plate is moving in a northeast direction, diving constantly under the Eurasian plate. It is this plate interaction which led to the formation of the Himalayan mountains. Right? It pushed up the material which today has become the Himalayas. And that's the reason why the Himalayas are young fold mountains. Right? They are much younger compared to other geological formations. And the Himalayas keeps continuing uh, to grow. As the Indian plate keeps moving in this direction and keeps diving under Eurasian plate, it keeps pushing up the Himalayas and it keeps growing in, in its height, even as we speak. Right? So that makes the whole region here and the region around it seismically very, very active. Now similarly, let's see the seismicity of Taiwan. Where is Taiwan located? See, can you see the small speck over here? That is the uh, island of Taiwan, the self-governing uh, democratic territory of Taiwan. So here basically, the plate interaction is between the Philippine plate on which Taiwan is sitting and the Eurasian plate. This is the convergent plate boundary in this part of the Pacific, in the Western uh, Pacific Ocean. Now, if you observe this seismic map here, you can see the Philippine plate, right? Almost three-fourth of the country, three-fourth of uh, Taiwan is resting on the Philippine plate. And it is moving in this direction, diving under the Eurasian plate here. And it's actually moving at a fa very fast rate, much faster than the Indian plate. If you compare the speed at which uh, this Philippine sea plate is moving towards the Eurasian plate. It's much faster than the movement of the Indian plate towards the Eurasian plate. So that makes the region seismically very, very sensitive. And Taiwan is sitting right on top of this plate boundary. If you ever go to Taiwan, right, you will notice a very unique geography here. Eastern Taiwan, this part of Taiwan right here, is completely mountainous. Alright, it's only the eastern part. The eastern and central parts of Taiwan is very mountainous, this whole stretch. Because of this movement, because the Philippine Sea Plate is moving towards the Eurasian Plate in this north, uh, northwest direction here. So this entire part of Taiwan is seismically very active and that is why it is highly prone to earthquakes. Now, let's understand the impact of the latest disaster. And let us compare this with the 1999 earthquake. Let's look at the data so that you understand what improvement that Taiwan has made. In 1999, Taiwan was hit by the Chi Chi earthquake. Chi Chi is the name of the place which, where it was epicentered. So in this earthquake, which was devastating in its impact, thousands of people had lost their lives. More than 50,000 buildings had collapsed. Thousands of people were injured. That was the impact of the 99 earthquake. Now let's compare this with the Julian earthquake that occurred recently. The 2024 earthquake. Julian is a city in eastern Taiwan, right? This earthquake, which was of almost a similar magnitude. The 99 earthquake was 7.7 .7 on the Richter scale. The Julian earthquake was 7.4 on the Richter scale. So not much of a difference. But look at the difference in its impact. Very few people were killed, just 13 people. And even these deaths, they were not because of building collapse. These deaths were because of rock slides and landslides, where tunnels had collapsed and material had crushed into vehicles. Right? Those were the people who died, the 13 people. Because of building collapse, not a single person lost their lives. And the number of buildings that fell, even at the epicenter, was very, very less. Hardly 50 buildings were damaged, not more than that. So this improvement that Taiwan has seen, it's because of the intervention that has been done through disaster management. Or else even this earthquake would have had a deadly impact. Thousands of people would have been killed because thousands of buildings would have collapsed. But Taiwan has made its infrastructure 
both private and public infrastructure resilient to the impact of earthquakes and cyclones and other disasters. So the credit goes to Taiwan's preparedness and its disaster management um, mechanisms that it has implemented. So this is where we draw direct lessons for India. See, Taiwan brought out the Disaster Prevention and Protection Act after the 99 earthquake. By then, around the world, there was greater awareness about uh, disaster management, the need for having a separate uh, domain of governance called disaster management. So Taiwan brought out this law. Uh, even at the global level, the UN also was pushing towards more streamlining of disaster management into regular governance. So Taiwan adopted this model, right, and it pa passed a law and established dedicated national centers to manage earthquakes, to plan and prepare for earthquakes. So it's these consistent efforts, especially in understanding the vulnerability, creating the hazard maps, in identifying the seismic zones at the local level, and in implementing the building codes, the building standards, in, in enforcing those building standards, in ensuring that the people follow these building standards. So that's what made the buildings of Taiwan secure, the infrastructure of Taiwan secure, and the impact has been very minimal. So this is the success of implementing the three steps of disaster management cycle. By 1990s, there was greater awareness around the world regarding the impact of disasters. This was the time when climate change, environmental issues was getting global uh, significance through the Rio Earth Summit. So climate change convention had been established, right, and other environment related conventions were taking shape. Around the same time, there was a recognition through the UN right, and by all the countries that we should pay more attention to disasters. So in Japan, a conference had been called the Yokohama Conference, which led to the first global framework on disaster management. Following that, there were two more UN conferences more recently, which led to the Hyogo framework of 2005 and the more recent Sendai framework in 2015. So there are three major frameworks at the global level. One is the Yokohama strategy, of 1994, the Hyogo framework of 2005, and the Sendai framework on disaster risk reduction of 2015. So these are the three important global frameworks on disaster management. All right, these were an outcome of the UN initiative. So as the global approach towards disasters was changing, it was becoming more structured. The call was, a call was given to implement a structured response to disasters, a well-planned, well-thought-out response to disasters. So Japan took the lead. Japan hosted all these summits. That's why these frameworks are named after Japanese cities. All three are Japanese cities. So with Japan taking the lead, other countries also started following the same. Now, for example, even in India, during the same period, in late 90s, early 2000, even we were hit by devastating disasters. For example, the Buj earthquake, the super cyclone of Odessa, and the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. India lost lakhs of people through these three disasters. Right? There was significant damage to our infrastructure. There was huge socio-economic impact because of the three disasters. That is what pushed the Manmohan Singh government in 2005 to enact the Disaster Management Act in India. It, it was based on the structure and principles of the same frameworks, the Yokohama strategy and the Hyogo framework. So Taiwan had taken a lead. By early 2000, it had brought out its Disaster Management Act and it was implementing the three steps of disaster management. Essentially, the DM cycle. Because until then, the global approach towards disaster management was very ad hoc. Most countries, they treated disasters as a one-time tragedy, as a one-time spontaneous event, right? They did, never saw the need for constant uh, work towards di disaster management. So thanks to Yokohama uh, strategy and then Hyogo framework, the world started realizing that we should look at disaster management as a cyclical approach, right? Because there will be a series of disasters which will keep happening, many of which can't be prevented. Only thing we can do is mitigate the impact, reduce the impact, plan better, prepare, deal with the disaster in a better way and recover as quickly as possible. So this led to the implementation of the DM cycle or the disaster management cycle, the three steps in disaster management. 
So it includes the pre-disaster phase, the pre-disaster phase, which includes planning, prevention and preparedness, right? Where you plan for the upcoming disasters. You understand the risk of a uh, risk profile of your country. You understand the vulnerability. You create hazard maps. You develop early warning systems, right? You build resilience to withstand the impact of disasters. So all these measures are part of pre-disaster planning, preparedness and prevention. Then during disaster, the second step, when the disaster has already hit, how do you respond to it? How do you provide emergency relief? How do you provide search and rescue operations? How do you provide uh, basic food, medicine and shelter and clothing to the affected population? How quickly can you assist the affected population? Then comes post-disaster management. After the disaster, in the long run, what measures will be taken for recovery, reconstruction, rehabilitation? Because people would have lost their homes, they'll have to be rehabilitated. Critical infrastructure might be damaged. Your airports, power lines, dams, right? Or even ports and airport and railway infrastructure, they could be damaged. You need to restore them, you need to reconstruct, you need to rebuild and recover as quickly as possible. And again, you begin the cycle, right? You again, go back to pre-disaster planning and preparedness. So this cyclical approach was promoted at the global level and Taiwan was one of the leading countries or regions which adopted this. So that is why Taiwan is way ahead of many other countries. It's on par with Japan. Japan is another country which has, which has been a global leader in disaster planning and preparedness and Taiwan is, is on par with Japan. So today, Taiwan has one of the most advanced earthquake resilient systems. It has invested in advanced early warning and, and forecasting and alert systems, right? At least a few seconds earlier before the shock waves can hit the, the crust of the earth, right? There are alerts which go out as soon as the initial um, release of the shock wave is, is identified. Immediately alerts are issued through one of the most advanced monitoring and early warning systems that gives enough time, maybe a few seconds of time for the people to run out and escape from the buildings. Next, Taiwan has done very well in spreading awareness through regular campaigns, drills, mock exercises, right? It has not only trained the government machinery and the disaster forces, but it has trained the people. The people themselves are aware what to do, what not to do, right? This plays a critical role during a disaster to save lives. And more importantly, the building standards are extremely taken, uh, well taken care of by Taiwan's government, right? The building codes are very strictly enforced. They have brought out local seismic maps for every county, for every um, rural hamlet, for every city. At the local level, they have developed seismic maps to understand the impact of such quakes, right? Based on past records. And accordingly, different zoning standards are employed. So in every different zone, different set of building standards are enforced very strictly by using incentives, by providing subsidies to the people. Now let me give you one, one very good example here. You can see this skyscraper, Taipei 101. At one time it was the world's tallest skyscraper, right? Now it has been overtaken by a few other buildings, but still it's a landmark, a landmark in Taipei, the capital of Taiwan. Now despite this earthquake, Right? Taipei was badly hit, but this building did not, did not even flinch. Apart from minor vibrations, nothing happened to Taipei 101. It's, it's 101 floors in its height. This is because of the dampener that you see here. You can see this massive, gigantic ball which has been placed at the top over here, right? With hydraulic supports to the foundation of the building. This acts as a counteracting force, right? It stabilizes the building during earthquakes. Such technologies, advanced construction technologies have been used in Taiwan, right? And Taipei 101 is just one example. If you visit, you can, you can go to the top and, and witness the ball dampener as well, which absorbs the shock waves and stabilizes the building in the event of an earthquake. So many skyscrapers in the cities adopt such technologies, right? The construction material that is used for our houses, the design of uh, critical infrastructure projects, they are all taken care of very well in Taiwan based on its seismic vulnerability.
Taiwan is a country of tunnels and bridges because it's a very mountainous country. There are hundreds of tunnels and bridges and every single tunnel and bridge is earthquake resilient. Very few tunnels had collapsed during the earthquake. That was only because of the, the mountains that, that slid down because of landslides and rock slides. Otherwise, the damage to infrastructure and buildings has been very limited. So this is entirely because of the better building standards, better planning, better preparedness. So that is the lesson we draw here for India. Because India also is very vulnerable, especially our zone 4 and zone 5 regions. You're looking at the seismic map of India. The Buj region here in Gujarat, part of uh, Maharashtra over here near the Koina Dam and the entire Himalayan belt, Northeast India and Andaman Nicobar. These are the most vulnerable zones in India, right? So the Himalayan belt comes under zone 5 and 4, which includes our national capital Delhi as well. Northeast India is under zone 5. Andaman Nicobar, which is close to the Pacific Ring of Fire, is also under zone 5. Now, despite being so vulnerable, despite witnessing many major earthquakes in the past, we still haven't enforced building standards in India. See, if earthquake hits an uninhabited place, it only remains a hazard, it never becomes a disaster, right? Because the biggest threat from earthquakes is for the buildings, right? What humans have constructed. It's when these buildings collapse, right? That is when the damage will happen. If you secure your buildings, make your infrastructure resilient to the impact of earthquakes, the damage can be minimized. That is the simple concept here. So India, even though we have a very robust disaster management machinery today, we have done very well with other disasters, like cyclones, for example. Today, India has done very well, right? Even in India, the death count is uh, in single digits or double digits. At one time when the super cyclone happened in Odessa, more than 10,000 people were killed. That, that has been brought down to single digits because we have better early warning, better preparedness, better eva evacuation uh, during cyclones. So we have done very well with other disasters. But when it comes to earthquakes, there is one big flaw in India, which is our building standards. We have failed to enforce them. We have failed to implement them. And this is like a ticking time bomb on which India is sitting. Many experts predict a massive mega earthquake to occur in the Himalayan belt. Right? It could happen any time. And it could have the ability to flatten most of the habitations here. And the worst part is the entire region is densely populated. You have major cities, towns with very dense population, very old buildings. None of them which follow the building standards. Right? So enforcing these standards, improving your design, your engineering, your construction is critical to deal with earthquakes. So that is what we learn from Taiwan's experience. Next, we have two other columns. We can take a quick look at this because we have had a discussion regarding the same recently. But I would just like to revise and revisit those topics because the writers are making a very good argument again. So we have this column on uh, page number six related to environment and ecology. Recently, the Supreme Court of India delivered a landmark judgment. Right? We had discussed this topic in detail, where the Supreme Court had recognized that the right to be protected against the effects of climate change as a fundamental right under Article 14 and Article 21. The Supreme Court held that climate change is having an adverse impact on right to equality because it disproportionately affects few uh, classes of people. Climate change was affecting your right to enjoy a clean, good environment, your right to lead a good, dignified life. So based on this, the Supreme Court held that the right to be protected against the impact of climate change is a fundamental right under Article 14 and 21. Now, this is a landmark ruling and that's what the writers are recognizing as well. And there was a similar incident in Switzerland. In uh, Europe, the European Court of Human Rights, it held the government of Switzerland accountable in a particular case where women, a women-led group had filed a case against the government of Switzerland that Switzerland was not doing enough to reduce emissions. And the European Court on Human Rights ruled that the inability of the Swiss government to reduce emissions was affecting the health of women, especially uh, senior citizens. And it held the government accountable. Legally, it was held accountable. So these are great precedents. That's what the writers are talking about. Today, as climate change becomes a reality, there is a constitutional evolution which is happening around the world, right? Where climate change is being seen as a devastating uh, uh, upcoming event, which can directly impact our socio-economic well-being. 
it can affect our democratic rights our political rights our economic rights and our social status as well so this is being recognized and constitutional status is being provided the right to be protected against climate change this could give rise to new jurisprudence new legal uh, uh, legal outcomes right where governments and concerned entities can be held accountable if they fail to protect these basic rights so that is the crux of the article right uh, there's nothing else to discuss here but the core point here is that given that courts are widening the interpretation recognizing the impact of climate change how it affects our basic rights and they are interpreting constitutional rights in such a way that climate change becomes integral to the constitution right fighting against climate change becomes integral uh, to the constitution so this could give rise to new legal outcomes new jurisprudence where you can secure these rights you can hold those who are responsible accountable especially your governments your um, representatives they can be held accountable potentially right if they fail to meet uh, these basic standards so that that is what we take away from this article next on the same page there is a column related to social justice uh, it deals with the rights of the disabled the fundamental and political rights of the disabled the reason why the topic is in news is because recently uh, right after the elections were announced few parties brought out their election manifesto right the congress and uh, uh, the communist party of india marxist cpim these two parties brought out their uh, party manifestos where they promise certain things to the electorate so in the party manifesto of the congress party and the cpim there is one important reference that they have made a very important reference a promise that they have made that if they are elected to power they will empower the disabled community in india by amending article 15 of the indian constitution this is the promise they have made both congress party and cpim have committed that if they are voted to power they are going to amend article 15 to ensure that disability is added as a ground for positive discrimination now let's understand why this is significant why it is important now what does article 15 deal with it's part of right to equality right the basic fundamental right uh, with regard to equality it states that the state can't discriminate it prohibits the state from discriminating against the citizens right on the grounds of race religion caste sex place of birth etc right but however there is there is a reasonable restriction provided the state can discriminate as long as it's a positive discrimination if you look at article 15 and even the related article 16 there can be a positive discrimination on the grounds of social and educational backwardness those who are socially backward educationally backward right particularly the scheduled caste the scheduled tribes and recently through an amendment the economically weaker sections as well so scs sts backward classes economically weaker section ews those who belong to these categories right those who are socially educationally and economically backward for them a positive discrimination can be created which is nothing but the policy of reservation the policy of affirmative action through article 15 and 16 reservation becomes a constitutional tool to empower the downtrodden sections of the society article 15 says there can't be any discrimination on the lines of religion race caste sex place of birth right but there is a scope for a positive discrimination a reasonable restriction is provided here so if the purpose is to uplift a socially backward community educationally backward community secure them seats in educational institutions secure them jobs in the government so that they can be uplifted this positive discrimination can be done right this is what we call as the policy of reservation the quota system uh, which is available for educational institutions and public employment so now there is a commitment on india under a un convention to provide such a positive discrimination for the disabled community those suffering from disabilities right now this is not included under article 
See, there is a UN convention that deals with this. The UN convention on the rights of people with disabilities. This was brought out in 2006. In the year 2006, right, the UN brought out the UN convention on the rights of persons with disabilities. And India is a signatory to it. We have ratified the convention. We have adopted this. That is why we enacted a law. The Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act was brought out in 2016. So in 2007, India signed and ratified the convention. India became a signatory to this convention. And in 2016, we have brought out a national law, which is largely in line with the UN convention. Now, the UN Convention recommends the policy of reservation for the disabled, a constitutional, uh, constitutionally guaranteed right. But in India, this has not been done till now. The Act does recognize the rights of persons with disabilities, provides a lot of, a lot of state benefits to them. But one change which has not been done till now is the amending of Article 15. So now, the two parties promising this brings this topic back into limelight. The writers are urging that whichever government comes to power, whichever party comes to power, they should honor this commitment. This commitment that we have towards the UN Convention, amend Article 15 and add a new ground for discrimination, which is disability, right? Ensure that there is no negative discrimination, just like there can't be any discrimination on the lines of religion, caste, a place, sex or birth, etc. Right? Similarly, there should be an addition here. Disability should be added, that the state should not discriminate on the grounds of disability and provide a positive discrimination, provide for additional constitutionally guaranteed reservation. Of course, there is a, a policy of reservation, but adding it right here under Article 15 would make a huge difference as this would be a constitutionally guaranteed right. So with this, we end the main topics which are relevant for the mains exam. Now let's take a look at the few prelims articles. On page number 12, we have an article referring to um, the Siachen Glacier, which is the world's highest battlefield. India's Defense Minister Rajnath Singh has visited uh, the Siachen battleground, met with Indian troops. Right, He has appreciated the bravery of Indian soldiers who are deployed at, at these punishing heights. So let's take a quick look at where is Siachen located. Right, and get a brief idea about the Siachen dispute. So in this map here, you can see the Siachen Glacier. This triangular region here, right? This is the Siachen Glacier. It occupies a strategic position, a, a vantage position. It is sandwiched between India, Pakistan occupied Kashmir, and China. Is that clear? This is the Xinjiang province of China over here. This is Gilgit-Baltistan region, which is supposed to be Indian territory, right? The, all these areas are Indian territory, but illegally occupied by Pakistan since 1947-48. So we call these areas as POK, Pakistan Occupied Kashmir. You can see the line of control, the temporary de facto border, right, which was previously the ceasefire line. You can also see point NJ9842, the northernmost point of LOC the last demarcated point between India and Pakistan. Beyond this, there is no clear demarcation. We just have a AGPL, actual ground position line, and there was no clear demarcation at the Siachen region. But if you look at Siachen, if you look at the conditions here, it is extremely harsh. The terrain is very complicated, right? The temperatures are minus 40, minus 50 degrees Celsius. It is completely inhospitable. You have very low oxygen, Right, and if if humans are present here, right, you risk frostbite uh, and uh, hypothermia, where your core body temperature could plummet, resulting in death, or you might lose your fingers, your toes because of frostbite. Plus the risk of avalanches, which is a major threat. So it's completely inhospitable. So until 1984, both India Pakistan, which saw Siachen as strategically vital, right, because of its location. Both maintained a military position at the lower heights of Siachen only during the summer months. Because during winter, conditions would get very harsh. And both India-Pakistan had this unwritten uh, agreement that we will withdraw the troops during the winter. Right? Because of the harsh climate, both sides had this unwritten agreement that we will withdraw the troops and we'll bring the troops only in the summer. 
But in 1984, Pakistan had a plan to betray India. Right? Pakistan wanted to capture the Siachen Heights to gain the vantage position. Right? Because as I told you, it faces uh, Xinjiang of China, Gilgit Baltistan in POK. It also faces Aksai Chin on the other side, which is under Chinese occupation. This is again Indian territory occupied by China in Ladakh. Here you can also see Shaksgam Valley, which Pakistan has leased to China. In 1963, Shaksgam Valley, which is supposed to be part of India, it's supposed to be part of POK, has been gifted away by Pakistan to China. So Siachen is right in between all these uh, strategic areas, most of which are disputed, conflicted between India, Pakistan and India, China. So in 1984, Pakistan was making a plan to occupy the Siachen Heights when Indian troops would be missing during the winter months. But fortunately for India, India received a tip-off. It received a vital intelligence input in Europe that Pakistan was procuring Arctic warfare equipment from a European defense manufacturer based out of London. Pakistani army had placed an order for a huge consignment of Arctic warfare equipment. So India's intelligence agency RAW, RAW's London station, picked up this information because India was also a customer for the same European defense manufacturer. Couple of years before this, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi had approved a few exploratory missions to polar areas like Arctic and Antarctic. The intention was to accustomize, uh, accl acclimatize our soldiers to operate in such harsh uh, weather conditions. So back then, in 1982 itself, India had procured few Arctic warfare equipment from the same company where RAW had few sources. So RAW would receive inputs that Pakistani army also had placed a huge consignment. Uh, a huge order. So, based on this intelligence, India's strategic establishment under Prime Minister Indira Gandhi sat down to assess this input as to what could be the reason that Pakistan is ordering this. Of course, Pakistan would not be interested in any polar expeditions. That would be the least concern for Pakistan. right? So, the only conclusion was Pakistan might use the gear to occupy Siachen Heights during the winter months. Based on this assessment, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi operationalized Operation Meghdoot, a highly secretive preemptive operation. Operation Meghdoot was approved by the Prime Minister and the plan was for the Indian Army to beat Pakistan. Essentially, procure the same Arctic warfare equipment, mobilize before Pakistan and capture the Siachen Heights before Pakistan can do this. So it was a preemptive operation. And the interesting story here is that India managed to procure a larger order and before Pakistan could get the delivery. And the Indian Army planned this daring operation with support from Indian Air Force and successfully captured the Siachen Heights. So since then, India occupies the most advantageous positions. We maintain a permanent presence here, right? Because Pakistan can't be trusted. And Pakistan also maintains a permanent presence at the lower heights near the Saltoro Ridge over here. This is the world's highest battlefield, the most expensive battlefield. Both sides have lost more soldiers uh, due to the harsh conditions. Not a single bullet has been fired, but several soldiers have lost their lives on both sides because of avalanches, hypothermia, etc. So this is one of the low-hanging fruits in the relationship. Many experts have suggested India-Pakistan can resolve the Siachen issue. We can work out a, a clear boundary here. right? But given Pakistan's uh, you know, pattern of betrayal, India has always been of the view that we can't negotiate over Siachen. It's a strategically vital area. It's right now under complete Indian control, right? And there's no way that India can uh, negotiate with Pakistan on this. So this remains a standing dispute between the two sides and India remains in control of the most advantageous positions in Siachen. Also note the Shok and Nubra river that originate from here. So all these points can be relevant for your prelims. Next, on page 14, there is a reference um, with regard to the controversial deportation asylum plan of United Kingdom. As you know, UK faces a huge uh, burden of refugees and illegal migrants. The UK receives huge waves of refugees and illegal migrants, especially from South Asia, West Asia and Africa, from Pakistan, from India as well. Lot of illegal migrants try to enter UK from Afghanistan, from Iraq and Syria, from African countries, from Lebanon. 
So a lot of people who are escaping poverty or escaping difficult circumstances, they illegally try to enter UK. In most cases, they reach Europe through the help of uh, human traffickers. They reach France somehow and they try to uh, navigate across the English Channel over here. They take these illegal uh, boats. Sometimes there are people who have jumped into the English Channel trying to swim to UK. So every month UK receives a lot of asylum seekers and it has become a very divisive political issue in the UK. So now UK has come out with a plan which is equally controversial. Its plan is to detain all the refugees, asylum seekers and the illegal migrants and fly them to an African country, a poor African country that is Rwanda. UK government has struck a deal with the government of Rwanda. So the idea is to detain all these asylum seekers, right? And instead of accommodating them in the UK until their status is decided by the courts, UK plans to deport them to Rwanda where Rwanda will receive financial support from UK. Essentially, UK is paying Rwanda for this service. So once deported here, then their cases for asylum will be decided by the courts. Right? So this essentially is seen as an inhuman uh, strategy and there is a lot of controversy regarding this plan of UK. Rwanda has agreed to it because for Rwanda, there is a financial incentive. UK will pay Rwanda to receive the asylum seekers and accommodate them. So this raises concerns for uh, refugee rights, human rights. India should also be concerned about this because there are quite a few Indian illegal migrants who get caught in UK. Right? So that is why the topic is relevant. Now coming to the last article for today. On the second uh, page of the Science and Tech Supplement uh, in the online edition of the Hindu, there's an article related to climate change, which, which says that Europe is the fastest warming continent, according to new studies. These studies were conducted by two institutions. One is the World Meteorological Organization of the UN, the WMO, and Copernicus of European Union. So both the institutions can be very important for your prelims. The WMO, please write this down. The WMO is a specialized agency of the UN. It's the authoritative institution of the UN that works in the field of meteorology, climate science. It studies the atmosphere, meteorological phenomena, the oceans, right? And these studies of WMO and the findings provide us scientific inputs with regard to climate change. It was established in 1950 in its current form, but its origin goes back to 1800s when the International Meteorological Organization was formed in 1873. So in 1950, after the UN was established, the IMO was transformed into WMO, World Meteorological Organization. It's headquartered in Geneva, in Switzerland. It has membership of 187 countries, including India. It brings out some important reports, runs many monitoring programs and important uh, surveillance programs to study meteorological phenomena, to study the uh, melting of glaciers, to study uh, the oceanic temperatures, right? Acidification of ocean, how it impacts uh, meteorological events, how it affects rainfall, to study the impact of El Nino, La Nina events, right? All these important studies are conducted by the WMO, which is a specialized agency of the UN. Now coming to Copernicus named after popular scientist Nicholas Copernicus, right? This is a climate monitoring system of European Union. The EU has an Earth observation uh, program run by the European Union Space Agency along with all the partners from EU member countries. So there are a set of satellites in orbit. There are ground stations that receive the data. There are a few research centers on the ground as well. So collectively, all these um, facilities that study the Earth, that study the climate, right? They are collectively called Copernicus. It's an initiative of European Union. You can say it's the Climate Monitoring Agency of the European Union. So please know about this. It's part of European Union space program. And there can be direct prelims questions based on this. So that is it for today. Please take down the mains practice questions. Use them for your answer writing practice. 
It's all based on what we have studied. You don't have to scratch your head. I've given you the points in the right order as well. Just use them to structure your answer and write the answers and post them in the comment section below. I hope you guys have liked the session. Do let me know in the comments. Do press the like button and uh, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. That is it for today. I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for watching.